one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Ken Kesey. The hero narrator Bromden, the son of a white woman and an Indian chief, pretends to be weak, deaf, and dumb. He has long been in a psychiatric hospital, fleeing within its walls from the cruelty and indifference of normal America. However, the years spent by Bromden in a psychiatric hospital make themselves felt. The head nurse, Miss Newson, who manages both the patients and the weak-willed Dr. Spivy, regulates, in his opinion, the passage of time, forcing the clock to either fly fast or stretch endlessly. By her order, the fog machine is turned on, and the pills that are given to the sick contain electronic circuits and help control the consciousness of both acute and chronic from the outside. According to Bromden, this branch is a factory in some ominously mysterious combine. Here they correct mistakes made in the neighborhood, in churches and schools. When the finished product is returned to society, completely repaired, no worse than new or even better, the heart of the elder sister rejoices. Randall Patrick M. Murphy, who managed to roam around America and serve time in many of its prisons, one day comes to this abode of sorrow. He served his last term in a colony, where he showed psychopathic tendencies, and now he has been transferred to a psychiatric hospital. However, he accepted the translation without chagrin. An inveterate gambler, he expects to improve his financial affairs at the expense of psychomugs, and the order in the hospital, according to rumors, is much more democratic than before. The chapter really flaunts its liberal principles, and the administration's public relations representative now and then gives tours touting the new trends in every way. Patients are well-fed, urged to cooperate with the medical staff, and all major problems are decided by voting on the board of patients, headed by someone Harding, who received a college education and is distinguished by eloquence and a complete lack of will. We're all rabbits, he tells McMurphy, and we're not here because we're rabbits, but because we can't get used to being a rabbit. McMurphy is anything but a rabbit, intending to take over this shop from the very first days he comes into conflict with the imperious Miss Newson. The fact that he jokingly plays cards with patients is not so bad for her, but he threatens the measured activity of the therapeutic community, ridicules the meetings at which, under the vigilant supervision of an older sister, patients habitually delve into someone else's personal life. This systematic humiliation of people is carried out under the demagogic slogan of teaching them to exist in a team, striving to create a democratic department, completely controlled by patients. McMurphy does not fit into the totalitarian idol of a mental hospital. He incites his comrades to break free, break the window, and break the grid with a heavy remote control, and even bets that he can do it. When his attempt ends in failure, then, paying off, or rather, returning IOUs, he says. At least I tried. Another clash between McMurphy and Miss Newson takes place over the TV. He asks to shift the TV schedule so that he can watch baseball. The question is put to a vote, and it is supported only by Cheswick, known for his obstinacy in words, but his inability to translate his intentions into action. However, he manages to soon get a second vote, and all 20 sharp vote to watch TV during the day. McMurphy triumphs, but the older sister informs him that a majority is needed for the decision to be made, and since there are only 40 people in the department, one more vote is not enough. In fact, this is a hidden mockery, since the remaining 20 patients are chronicles, completely cut off from objective reality. But then Bromden raises his hand, going against his life rule not to open up. But even this is not enough, as he raised his hand after the meeting was declared closed. Then McMurphy turns on the TV without permission and does not move away from it, even when Miss Newson turns off the electricity. He and his comrades look at a blank screen and get sick with might and main. According to doctors, McMurphy is a disorder factor. The question arises of transferring him to the violent department, and more radical measures are proposed. But Miss Newson is against it. She needs to break him in the department to prove to everyone else that he is not a hero, not a rebel, but a cunning egocentric who cares about his own good. In the meantime, McMurphy's pernicious influence on patients is obvious. Under his influence, Bromden notes that the fog machine suddenly broke down, he begins to see the world with the same clarity. But McMurphy himself moderates his rebellious fervor for a while. He learns the sad truth. 
if he ended up in a colony for a period determined by the court, that he was placed in a mental hospital until the doctors consider him in need of treatment, and therefore, his fate is entirely in their hands. He ceases to stand up for other patients, shows caution in sorting things out with his superiors. Such changes entail tragic consequences. Following the example of McMurphy, Cheswick fights desperately for the right to smoke cigarettes any time and as much as he likes, ends up in a violent department, and then, upon his return, tells McMurphy that he fully understands his position and soon commits suicide. This death makes a strong impression on McMurphy, but he is even more amazed by the fact that, it turns out, the vast majority of Miss Newson's patients are here of their own free will. He resumes the war with his older sister with new energy, and at the same time, teaches patients to feel like full members of society. He puts together a basketball team, challenges the orderlies to a competition, and although the match is lost, the main goal is achieved. The patient players feel like people. It was McMurphy who saw through Bromden, realizing that he was only pretending to be deaf and dumb. He instills in Bromden confidence in himself and his abilities, and under his guidance, he tries to lift the heavy console, each time tearing it off the floor higher and higher. Soon McMurphy comes up with the seemingly crazy idea to go with the whole squad to the sea on a boat to fish for salmon, and despite the exhortations of Miss Newson, the team is going. And although the captain of the boat refuses to go to sea due to lack of necessary papers, the psychos do it without permission and get great pleasure. It is on this boat trip that the timid and shy Billy Bibbit meets Candy, McMurphy's girlfriend, who he really likes. Realizing that it is extremely important for poor Billy to finally establish himself as a man, McMurphy arranges for Candy to come to them the next Saturday and spend the night with them. But before Saturday, there is another serious conflict. McMurphy and Bromden engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the orderlies, and as a result, they end up in the riot ward and receive electroshock treatment. After enduring psychotherapy, McMurphy returns to the ward just in time for Saturday to receive Candy, who arrives with her friend Sandy and a supply of liquor. The fun becomes quite violent, and McMurphy and his friends arrange a rout in the possessions of their older sister. Realizing that the initiator of the holiday, as they say, cannot take off his head, the patients persuade him to run away, and he generally agrees, but alcohol takes its toll. He wakes up too late when the orderlies are already there. Miss Newson, barely restraining her rage, surveys her department, which was badly damaged during the night. Billy Bibbit has disappeared somewhere. She goes looking for him and finds him with candy. Miss Newson threatens to tell Billy's mother everything, reminding her how hard she is going through her son's eccentricities. Billy is horrified, screaming that it's not his fault, that McMurphy and others forced him, that they teased him, called names. Satisfied with her victory, Miss Newson promises Billy to explain everything to his mother. She takes Billy to Dr. Spivey's office and asks him to talk to a patient, but the doctor comes too late. Torn between fear of his mother and self-loathing for his betrayal, Billy slits his own throat. Then Miss Phylison attacks McMurphy, reproaching him for playing with human lives, blaming him for the deaths of both Cheswick and Billy. McMurphy snaps out of the daze he was in and lashes out at his nemesis. He rips open the head nurse's dress, exposing her large breasts for all to see, and grabs her by the throat. The orderlies somehow manage to drag him away from Miss Vile, but the witchcraft spells are dispelled, and it becomes clear to everyone that she will never again use the power that she had. Gradually, patients are either discharged home or transferred to other departments. Of the old men, acute patients, only a few people remain, including Bromden. It is he who witnesses the return of McMurphy. The head nurse was defeated, but did everything so that her opponent could not rejoice at his victory. After a lobotomy, a merry fellow, a rowdy, a cheerleader turns into a vegetable. Bromden cannot allow this man to exist as a reminder of what happens to those who go against authority. He suffocates it with a pillow, then smashes the window and breaks the screen with the very remote that McMurphy taught him to lift. Now nothing can block his path to freedom. 